for the invasion. Japan sent a massive amount of opium into Manchuria before landing Japanese troops in 1931. Britain was playing for empire and had been practicing this sort of thing for centuries, and Pearl Harbor would keep the Americans from having much to say about the course of the war if the seas were ruled by the Royal Navy, especially with the addition of the French fleet commandeered by Britain after the invasion of Hitler's troops into France. Japan's military had been trained and equipped by the British, and the Japanese could use the oil in the Dutch East Indies after Pearl Harbor. If the Americans sided with Germany and Japan, then the British would certainly lose their empire, so Churchill pushed a Europe-first contract with FDR that would concentrate on the European theater against Germany, while war against Japan would be limited to a holding action. Churchill's plan had included getting Russia to fight Japan, but that never happened, and if it had, there would have been fewer Russians to defend against the Germans invading the motherland. Getting Russia involved against Japan would not have been a good idea, because even though there were actual hordes of Japanese living in America, Japan well knew what a huge task it would be to fight both Russia and the United States after Pearl Harbor, so the Japanese did not attack Russia. Churchill's job in 1911 had been to modernize the Royal Navy, and English shipping companies and shipbuilders were continuing to lose business after the Great War to French and Italian and German shipyards and ramming ships with U-boats left too many survivors, as had happened with the Titanic, so torpedoes from submarines blamed on Germany would be a boon to British shipbuilders and a blessing for the Royal Navy's budget. During the Great War, Churchill kept his own small private naval army at Calais, made up of 400 family friends and Churchill had plenty of vehicles and accommodations and diversions for them, and Kishner complained that they should either join the army or go home because the regular soldiers were complaining about Winston's private elite army, and these young friends of Churchill would form the corps of his officers in Belgium during Hitler's war. The labor strikes in England were even worse in 1926, with the coal miners the last to return to work, and Churchill was certain that Russian Jew communists were behind the strikes, that ordinary Englishmen were happy to be laboring in the manner to which they'd grown accustomed. Edward VIII had gone to visit the poor common coal miners once, although his advisers told him not to go since no king had ever done such a thing before. And while the common people loved Edward and stood on their feet to cheer him, Edward seemed not to understand what he was seeing. Churchill had been made president of the Board of Trade in 1908 for two years, and he sent a bill through Parliament improving the safety of the miners by reducing their shift to eight hours, which just made them more poor. And then in February of 1910, Churchill was in charge of the Home Office, which was the Odd Jobs and General Complaints Department and Churchill had to answer grievances from coal miners, and he had to write a letter to the king every day about what was going on in the House of Commons. Churchill was also responsible for prison reform, and he wanted to force the prisons to show a concert or a lecture to entertain the prisoners four times a year, and he gave England labor exchanges to point the unemployed towards work, an idea he'd gotten from Germany. The labor exchanges opened in 1910, with 17 of them set up in London, and Churchill tried to pass a bill to reduce drunkenness by cancelling the majority of tavern licenses, and that passed the House of Commons, but failed to pass the House of Lords. When the railway workers went out on strike, Churchill called out the army, believing that the labor unions were communist agitators and Churchill had no tolerance for workers' complaints, but insisted that they be given a tea-break every day. 
every time the crown raised taxes and lowered wages, the common English working man would go out on strike, and Churchill blamed Russian Jew communists for having started up the labor unions in the first place, and for stirring up the workers to strike. The communists might as well have been communists to their British masters, meaning those uncultured, base, disrespectful people who were more like Americans, the rabble-rousing common people wanting to take the nobility down a notch under the mistaken belief that perhaps they could thereby better themselves, those unwashed miscreants wanting to get the right to vote in their neighborhood Soviets, just as Hitler's party caucuses would begin doing in Germany after the Great War. Churchill would sail around on a navy yacht named the Enchantress to the tune of thirteen thousand pounds per year, and he watched the Royal Navy's new ships being built, and Parliament complained it would be cheaper for Churchill to take the train. Regularly visiting Germany, Churchill especially enjoyed reviewing German military maneuvers, and he would go back and forth from France studying the territory making careful note of the fact that the Rhine moved through France before returning to Germany on its way to the sea, and Churchill was heartily obsessed with the idea of floating mines down the Rhine. Parliament decided to completely update the Royal Navy in 1912, because the Moslems in Turkey were rioting, and that meant the Russians would soon be on the way to shut them down. And the Defense of the Realm Act would be passed in Britain in 1916 to control the supply of opium for all the soldiers wounded during the Great War. In 1920, Britain passed the Dangerous Drugs Act that said they could board any vessel on the high seas to search and seize contraband and Germany was doing well recovering from the Great War by 1920, and two-thirds of Germans were making enough money to pay taxes, and Germany had become the third largest in shipping right behind New York and Amsterdam, and ahead of London. British shipping companies and shipyards had been losing business because sea-bound cargo carriers were competing with the railroads and Churchill's Port Authority had been boarding and searching boats, which became one of the better jobs in England. And for cross-channel commerce, the British shippers could not match the low prices of Dutch and German companies, who were not required to pay the high taxes to support Churchill's Port Authority. The Japanese had worked with the British to patrol the Southeast Asian oceans, and they used submarines during the Great War and if submarines attacked the shipping lanes and Germany was made to take the blame, Parliament would be forced to beef up the Royal Navy even further, on top of the bonus of insurance companies having to cough up huge payments to ship owners to replace their sunken cargo ships, and it had seemed like a win-win situation. The British had been helping Japan build a military to fight China, and a fight with France over the poppy lands in Indochina called the Golden Triangle. And when a submarine sank the Lusitania on the 7th of May in 1915, it hit the exact place where gunpowder was being stored below decks. The torpedo might not have had sufficient effect had those explosives not been on board, or had those firing the torpedo not known precisely where to strike the ship. As British ships were hit with torpedoes, America told Germany to cut it out, but the Germans swore they'd called off their wolf packs as requested by the Americans, yet submarines were still firing torpedoes in the shipping lanes, and when the Lusitania blew up, America had to get into the war to keep the British from attacking American shipping, the theory being to keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Churchill wanted to get the French out of both North Africa and Southeast Asia. And while the French would be easy to dislodge from North Africa, and the French were no match for the Japanese in Vietnam, 
the Italians in North Africa were more dangerous because they'd been there longer, having lived in Libya ever since they had once been Rome. The British would sink the French fleet in Algeria first thing on the 3rd of July in 1940, killing 1,300 French sailors, and they bombed the Italian Navy in November of 1940, and the French would scuttle what was left of their own navy to keep it out of the hands of the British a couple weeks after the Americans landed in North Africa in November of 1942. Churchill claimed that the French fleet had not been turned over to the British when Hitler marched into France in May of 1940, and adding those ships to the Royal Navy would have left Britain the supreme overlord of the Mediterranean and put them squarely in a position to cut a deal with Hitler favorable to Britain. But the Americans had now joined in the war and began interfering right away with Churchill's best laid plans. The American Merchant Marine Act of 1936 was known primarily as the Ship Subsidy Bill, and in 1935, 90% of American ships were 20 years or older, thanks to the Great Depression. And economists warned about the evil and waste of government money mixed in with the private sector, but when the private businesses stayed too private or needed a shot in the arm, a little government money didn't hurt, just as long as the government wasn't trying to profit from building ships, turning the rules of production into counterproduction. The Americans wanted to stop the government from creating huge shipyards that would build massive amounts of unneeded boats, which would put private boat builders out of business. So the U.S. Shipping Board was created to protect private boat builders and only civilians could serve on the shipping board. The Royal Navy had a similar board, but the difference was that the British board was all military, while the Royal Navy didn't make any money on building ships. Their job was to safeguard the shipping lanes. And the Royal Navy needed more money from Parliament to protect British shipping, because the Royal Air Force, RAF, was being heralded as the latest thing and a less expensive solution to the costly Royal Navy. Parliament had fallen in love with airplanes and was putting more money into airfields than they were willing to spend on the struggling Royal Navy, so the plan was to prove that airplanes were sitting ducks on the ground and inferior to the mobility of warships, and the Battle of Britain began as a competition between the RAF and the Royal Navy. Churchill simply wanted to prove to Parliament that airplanes were unreliable and too dangerous to take seriously, and that safe, steady, and economical shipping could only be protected by sea. Aircraft carriers were also said to be too unwieldy and vulnerable, which the Royal Navy proved by hitting the Italian fleet as it was resting peacefully in harbor six months after Hitler marched into France. What better way to discredit the airplane than to entice the Germans into a little shooting war? The RAF would lose all their funny, rickety planes, and instead of building more, the Royal Navy would point to the Germans' new battleships, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, as fair warning about the strength of bigger armored ships. So the Royal Navy and Admiral Canaris put on a little show for Parliament with sea exercises using live ammunition. The Battle of Britain began on the 13th of August in 1940 and would last until late September, with poor English working-class neighborhoods full of labor agitators as the primary targets. And Hitler bombed some British airplane factories on the 23rd of August, but a dozen German planes drifted off target and hit London instead, and nine civilians died. So England retaliated by bombing Berlin four times. The British liked to bomb Germany at night to save more pilots, and the Americans would bomb during the day to save more civilians. But after a while, it didn't matter any more when much of Germany would be reduced to rubble, and fires from the bombing would get so hot they could create tornadoes. 
The British government had not been able to tax their subjects highly enough to keep up appearances in the far-flung British territories, and the Royal Navy had become too expensive to keep afloat without borrowing more money from British banks already holding collateral on loans that included mortgage bonds bought up cheap during the Wall Street crash of 1929 and its sequel in 1934. And when Germans started defaulting on their mortgage payments on those bonds and real estate prices in Germany began to drop precipitously with all the empty Jewish homes flooding the market, the British bankers needed mortgage payments coming in, so Hitler became their vehicle to make Germany prosperous enough that Germans could afford to pay their mortgages again. The consensus in America was that it was better for Germany to be reduced to rubble than it was for it to become a British satellite. And the French in Tunisia and the Italians in Libya were a threat to Britain who needed control of the Suez Canal to keep British ships moving from India to Europe. So the French and the Italians had to be put out of business in the Mediterranean. But the question was how to cripple France and Italy without a protest from the Americans who would certainly come over to help their French friends, just as they had during the Great War. There was that French Statue of Liberty in America's New York Harbor. There were the Italian families running all the labor unions in America. And all those Irish and Scots and Germans in America Obviously, America was the biggest threat to the British Empire and needed to be put in its place. So if Hitler was invited into France and Italy, then the British army counter-invading would be welcomed as, liber as liberators. British troops in France would present themselves as saviors and protectors against the evil Nazis and France would be forced to sign the Anglo-Franco Union Treaty, and under orders of the British Army, the French would no longer be able to cause trouble in the Mediterranean or threaten traffic on the Suez Canal. The plan was to show the Americans what empire was all about, and the Americans would be handed a clever and resounding defeat that would keep them away from European affairs for a long, long time. Churchill rented two floors of the Rockefeller Center in America in the spring of 1940, and he opened offices in all major American cities, while FDR sent Bill Donovan to England to spy on the British, and especially to check up on Joe Kennedy, who was hobnobbing with the Wallace and Edward crowd. Donovan had been a colonel in the Great War, and he and FDR had gone to Columbia Law School together. And Donovan found out that the British did not like Joe Kennedy, not because Joe liked Hitler, which nobody believed even though British intelligence produced forged documents to prove it, but because Joe Kennedy didn't like the British, who didn't like Joe Kennedy because he was Irish. In December of 1940, Donovan spent over a week in Bermuda to listen to tittle-tattle and take names and soak up some sun. Joe Kennedy was a rogue patriot outside the mainstream of Washington politics, and he was a personal friend of FDR, and FDR's New Deal had included provisions to investigate the Great Crash, and Joe Kennedy had been the first chairman of the SEC that prosecuted over 300 people, but only one of them went to jail, and it was only for three years. Now, instead of investing, Americans thought that working for a living was a better idea than buying and selling stocks, and among all the other losers, Churchill had lost a fortune in the crash of 1929. Now the New Deal contracted with companies to make war work possible, and less than 20% of market gains during Hitler's war would come from private money. In 1938, the bankers held a capital strike to protest both the New Deal and Hitler's strength through joy program because the market had skewed towards government employment and not enough people 
were taking out loans to keep the banks in business, and to make matters worse, in Germany real estate prices were continuing to fall. The capital strike hurt Hitler's economic plan, and he had to go into Poland to get more sources of revenue when the banks stopped lending money to Germany. And as the British Prime Minister in 1937, Chamberlain had been in charge of building up the British military and reintroduced conscription in 1938, signing a pact with Hitler personally on the 30th of September in 1938 that gave Hitler permission to substantially enlarge the German Navy in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, which in turn gave the British Navy reason to demand increases of their own. We, the German Führer and Chancellor, and the British Prime Minister, have had a further meeting today and are agreed in recognizing that the question of Anglo-German relations is of the first importance for the two countries and for Europe. We regard the agreement signed last, last night and the German Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two people never to go to war with one another again. We are resolved that the method of consultation shall be the method adopted to deal with any other questions that may concern our two countries, and we are determined to continue our efforts to remove possible sources of difference and thus to contribute to assure the peace of Europe. Signed, Adolf Hitler, Neville Chamberlain, September thirtieth, 1938. To Hitler, that last line meant your contributions to peace are effective. Keep up the good work. Your army is strong enough to keep out the Russians. To Chamberlain, that last line meant, Before you use any of those weapons you're building, please call us, and together we'll fight the Russians. Chamberlain would be smeared and denigrated by the BBC and all the British newspapers when Hitler went into Norway and the public turned against Chamberlain, but it had gone a long way towards getting more money approved for the Royal Navy, and Churchill displaced Chamberlain to become the new Prime Minister the same day that Hitler marched into France. Shipping companies in America did not want to compete with the government in the shipping business. While in England the Royal Shipping Board was in the business of keeping itself in business by creating a threat to the shipping lanes worthy of protection from the Royal Navy, especially to safeguard passage through the Suez Canal, and the British had started the Boer War to protect their passage around the Cape Horn. At the Dogger Bank in 1904, after the Boer War, the Russian Navy had to shoot up a Royal Navy commando squad disguised as a group of fishing boats that were on a mission to ambush Russian ships, and the Russians succeeded in stopping the British fishing boats from laying mines at Dogger Bank. The Boer War was also called Kishner's War, and Horatio Kishner didn't know how much food people ate because his food had always been prepared and brought in by servants and he didn't know how much horses ate, because someone else always fed the horses, and he didn't know what it was like to have one's family thrown out of their home, because Kishner had never had a family of his own, but he did have a pet starling. The British took over all the Boer courts, and put the Boers in concentration camps, and then Kishner's friends confiscated the camp inmates' land while 26,000 Boer families died in the camps, and the inmates were said to have gotten sick because they hadn't kept themselves clean. Kishner said that he'd been told the camps were being run in a military fashion, and he said that he'd never visited them, and 30,000 native South Africans also died in the Boer War, having fought on both sides, and many had signed up to fight with the British thinking it would do them some good afterwards, but the British left behind, left them behind and told the South Africans that they should be grateful for having had the experience. Kishner was sent to India in 1911 and would become Haig's commander-in-chief for the Great War, 
and on the 28th of July in 1912, the Royal Navy seized two battleships being built for Turkey, even though the ships had already been paid for by the Turks, and the 500 Turkish sailors waiting to board their new battleships were detained by the British, and the next day Parliament passed the bill to modernize the Royal Navy. Turkey signed a pact with Germany on the 2nd of August, less than a week after the new ships had been seized. Holland had become prosperous building ships, and the Royal Navy had completely destroyed the Dutch fleet in 1797 because Holland had become friends with France, and a Dutch William of Orange had become the King of England in 1688 when he married the great pretender's half-sister, and the French had moved into Holland with Napoleon in 1795 where they were welcomed by the Dutch people. So the British had declared war on the Dutch, and had won the Cape of Good Hope away from the Dutch, setting up the Boer War, and the Kaiser of Germany had indeed meddled in Africa in support of the Boers. As soon as Chamberlain had the Naval Agreement paper signed in September of 1938, Britain made a pact with Poland and started the military draft in England, and then tried to negotiate a deal with Russia that wasn't such a good deal for Russia. And Stalin made his non-aggression pact with Hitler on the 20th of August in 1939. Poland had been promised military assistance from Britain, and that wouldn't work out so well for them and Britain declared war on Germany over the Polish deal that was based on the naval agreement giving Germany the port of Danzig back so Germany could upgrade their new expanded naval fleet. Hitler had signed a ten-year non-aggression pact with Poland in 1934 because British newspapers had been running stories about Hitler's maniacal aggression towards Poland and the pact between Hitler and Stalin was that Germany would deliver guns and machinery to Russia over the next two years so the Russians could keep out the British, and for their part, Russia would send Germany raw materials. The night Hitler signed the pact with Stalin, the northern lights appeared in full cosmic display as far south as Berchtesgaden, and Hitler knew that God was on his side. 1940 was an election year in America, and FDR was promising to keep America out of the European war, and the vice president of the U.S. had been awarded a raise from five to twelve thousand dollars per year in 1938, and Burton had immediately signed a treaty with Germany, allowing Hitler to have Czechoslovakia in exchange for reparation payments due the crown from the Great War now possible with Germany's, Germany's expanded economic base in Czechoslovakia. Air raid drills began in England in response to Germany taking over Czechoslovakia, half of whom spoke German anyway, and the Slovak half of Czechoslovakia was Russian. The pact between Hitler and Stalin split Poland between Russia and Germany. And at first the Germans held up their part of the bargain by occupying their half of Poland on the 1st of September in 1939. And the Russians moved into their half on the 17th of September. And the Germans and the Russians lined up anyone who could speak English and shot them dead, just to be sure, while the British expeditionary force was sailing over to the French-Belgian border just 30 miles away from Calais. There would be no shooting during the phony war while British and German agents entered into some furious currency speculation in Brussels, and to put an end to the ruin of their currency, the German army marched into Brussels to close down the banks until some cents could be brought back to the market. After yellow journalism in England spread paranoia about Jew communists infiltrating and crippling the French and German banks in 1924, resulting in the Labour Party being soundly defeated, 
The crown went back to the gold standard in 1925, hoping to increase the worth of the pound. But this made British exports more expensive, so corners were cut at the workplace. And as wages were lowered, the workers went out on strike again, not just over pay cuts, but because workplace conditions had worsened. Two and a half million English went out on strike in 1926, but were silenced by the Crown and forced to go back to work under threat of death. Most countries went back on the gold standard from 1923 to 1929, but some did not. And England had gone back to gold in 1925 with the Dawes Plan, hoping to squeeze some gold out of Germany. But the English continued to strike and riot, so the Crown made union activity illegal in 1927, and now brother unions could not strike in support of others on strike, and political funds and union dues were strictly controlled. The following year, movie pictures with sound came over to England, and in 1928 the Crown took over control of the BBC. The newspapers spread fake news that Germany was defaulting on war reparations, and the U.S. Treasury had loaned a great deal of money to Germany to help them pay France and England for reparations from the Great War, and the fake news said that the American banks were failing along with the U.S. Treasury, and many Americans grew concerned that their money was no longer safe in banks, and the panic of 1929 got underway. People began to cash in their bonds and put their money under their mattresses, and once the panic started, it couldn't be slowed because it was physically impossible to move cash fast enough to satisfy the demand. Depositors would line up for blocks demanding their cash, and if the bank closed its doors and told their customers to come back in a few days, more and more people in the next few days would show up demanding their money. As banks failed from depositors withdrawing their money, the stock market was doomed. And there was no central bank in America such as was operating like the Bank of England, so each American bank was left on its own to live or die. The small banks had been sending depositors money to larger city banks in 1928, and the city banks were loaning that money to people buying stocks and all the banks made a small profit from the interest on these loans. People who had bought stocks on margin needed to add cash to their portfolios when the price of stocks fell below the amount of their loans no longer covered by the price of their collateral, and desperate for cash, stock owners would sell at lower and lower prices until a buyer could be found, and as stock prices fell, the borrowers could not make payments on their loans, and were forced to sell more and more of their stocks, while the lower-priced stocks no longer were acceptable as collateral on further loans to buy back stock. <clears throat> the stock price tumbled downwards as nobody could come up with the money to buy them, and more and more stocks needed to sell to meet payments on the original loans and the banks tried to sell seized property that had been used as collateral, money that was needed to pay the bank's employees. But there were fewer and fewer buyers stepping forward. Because a run on gold would not end well, America decided to declare a moratorium on European war debts that wouldn't happen until 1931, but all the insiders knew about it beforehand and got out before the stock market crashed. At the end of 1929, the Young Plan replaced the Dawes Plan, allowing Germany to make payments after the stock market had crashed because Germany was suffering over all the American dollars they'd invested that had now disappeared. Half of Germany wanted people to rule themselves as Russia was doing, and the other half wanted a return to the stable nobility who could negotiate with Britain over reparation payments. The Germans had soon enough become terrified of their fellow Germans, and there were not enough 
police to keep order, and the German army was split right down the middle. America offered to help Germany with loans, but when some Germans stepped forward to accept American aid, Britain responded by cutting off the importation of food. When America forced the Young Plan on Britain in 1929, the British started calling loans on other countries that in turn began abandoning gold until September of 1931. And after 1931, Britain also abandoned gold again, and another collapse on Wall Street caused the Young Plan to be scrapped in 1932. And while $2 trillion were made available from the RFC to make loans, FDR's New Deal was offering direct assistance from the government instead of pushing loans, and that would make the market crash again in 1934. The Lausanne Conference in 1932 had cancelled German reparations altogether, and the following year Hitler was appointed Chancellor, and England, Italy, and some other countries made a meager attempt in June of 1933 to pay a portion of the war debt due to the U.S., but France paid nothing, and Finland paid in full. To help England and India, Spain and China, the Thomas Amendment relented on the silver standard asked by London, and the U.S. declared an emergency on the 13th of December in 1933 because a decent society wouldn't work unless and until most of the people believed it to be fair. All belligerents and neutrals had gone off the gold standard in 1914 for the Great War, but the U.S. was one of the few who had kept their paper money pegged to gold. And the U.S. made exporting gold from America illegal from late 1917 to the summer of 1919. And redeeming currency with gold was not encouraged, so it was more of a semi-gold standard. It all went swimmingly until people learned that the U.S. Treasury was loaning great amounts of money to Germany to pay their war debt to Britain from the Treaty of Versailles, and because the British were insisting on payment in gold rather than in paper cash, people were rushing to buy gold, paying higher and higher prices until gold was selling for much more than it was worth. When a bank refused to exchange paper for gold, that paper money had lost its value and countries went off the gold standard because they were running out of gold, and banks went off the gold standard because people had gone off the farm standard. While France was still on the gold standard, a franc was worth four cents to the gold dollar, and within six months of FDR stopping the gold exchange, a franc was worth six cents, and three months after stopping gold payments, FDR told the London World Economic Conference that the U.S. was not returning to gold, but wanted to make prices in America rise with the depreciation of the dollar. The greenback dollar had been printed after the war between the states to pay the war debt, and the greenback could not be used for import tariffs that required gold and interest on the U.S. public debt had to be paid in gold, and that would make Congress borrow responsibly. The greenback was fiat money from 1861 to 1879, when greenbacks were allowed to be exchanged for gold, and that would continue until the U.S. went off the gold standard in 1933, when Britain refused to allow Germany to use greenbacks on loan from America to pay England to pay America. A Confederate dollar had been worth 90 cents in gold, but by the end of the war between the states, a Confederate dollar was worth 0 .017 cents, 0 .017 cents, because the North had doubled its money supply while the South had increased theirs by 20 times. The U.S. would retire greenbacks at various times, but after 1879 they were recirculated back into the American economy, fixing their value at 346,681,016 dollars. The U.S. Treasury 
was required to keep a certain minimum amount of gold in its vaults. And when people began exchanging their paper money for gold at any price, that made gold more and more expensive to buy, and so going off the gold standard would not only stabilize the currency, but would also stop people from trying to hoard gold. When FDR abandoned the gold standard in 1933, he signed the Debt Default Act, so foreign governments who defaulted could not get any more loans from the U.S. Treasury, and that was intended to make Europe too poor to be able to carry on any war without supplies and loans from America. With this plan by FDR, it was assumed that Europe would now have a lasting peace. In going off the gold standard, everyone in the U.S. was required to surrender their gold certificates and gold coins in exchange for cash, and all American gold coins were melted down into bars, and the new dollar was worth 60 cents, 60 percent of its former value. The dollar lost no value for a month after the announcement because people thought it was just a temporary halt to stabilize the gold market but the gold ban stayed. And soon it took more dollars to buy a British pound, and that meant that instead of buying tin boxes from England, it was cheaper to buy tin boxes made in America. As English tin box makers became unemployed, they joined the rest of their countrymen rioting in the streets. Since going off the gold standard in the spring, an ounce of ounce of gold was selling for a little over twenty dollars but by the middle of the first month of the new year the price was now over thirty four dollars the u.s. had only spent one hundred and thirty million dollars buying back gold but speculators had pushed the amount of dollars traded to over a billion and commodity prices had so far failed to rise despite the increased money supply since America only went off the gold standard domestically to raise prices and make more dollars available to Americans, it still kept to the gold standard internationally, so the British had to either buy dollars with gold and lose their own supply, which would force them off the gold standard, or fork over more gold than they thought was fair. America loaned Germany dollars to buy gold, to pay England, to pay America, and the loan was much larger than Germany had imagined, because by then it cost a pretty penny to buy a piece of gold. But Britain was still not satisfied with Germany's renewed gold payments. America went ahead and loaned gold to Germany, and the British claimed that the gold was worth less than the U.S. said it was, so when Britain demanded more gold from Germany, they asked the U.S. Treasury to loan more, and the price of gold began to fall as America hauled it out of the vaults and shipped it to Germany. When Germany received a pile of gold, they would print the going amount of German cash and send it to Britain, who insisted on gold, not cash. Britain owed America plenty of gold, and with the lower price for gold, that gold being sent to the U.S. Treasury was worth less, and so the British balked at having to pay more. The U.S. announced it would buy newly mined gold at 30% more than the going rate, and 27 cents more than it was selling overseas, and people rushed to trade their gold for U.S. dollars. When the U.S. started buying gold in Europe, the price went up higher and a billion dollars of depreciated U.S. dollars went into the pockets of the gold sellers by January of 1934, and by that time the U.S. Treasury had gathered two-thirds of the world's gold supply. Speculators had moved a billion dollars in gold sales, and on the 30th of January in 1934, the U.S. declared the domestic dollar to be off the gold standard, but international trade and all debt between America and other countries was to be done only in gold bullion regulated by the U.S. Treasury. Sweden 
had wanted to give Mr. Dawes the Nobel Peace Prize for coming up with the Dawes Plan, which was that Germany would pay England reduced reparations in gold, but pay the Americans back in America's own inflated dollars. But the Americans had just said no, and passed the Young Plan instead, which put Germany and England back on the same level playing field. The sale or purchase of gold within America as money was outlawed, except with a license from the Treasury, and while the dollar was now off the gold standard in America, prices in America did not rise as had been hoped. FDR had announced the embargo on gold on the 19th of April in 1933, and that had made those wondering whether the March 6th law was just temporary stop their wondering, and on the 12th of May the Thomas Amendment let Britain make payments in silver, but they only made a token payment instead of offering something meaningful, while France refused to participate in any scheme they knew favored Britain. The U.S. was kind enough to hold the July 1933 World Monetary and Economic Conference on British soil to make it easy, for, easy as possible for Britain to agree to pay their fair share. And agreeing to trade in silver was called the limping standard and quickly proved that any bimetallic system would quickly become a single standard of either gold or silver, just as the French had warned. The following month in August, FDR nationalized silver and told Britain they were in default, which meant war because if the Crown was allowed to repay American silver, they could print cheaper money, then send silver to America and bring down the price of English coal so Italy would rather buy it from England than Germany, then raise the wages of the working class by paying them in the inflated funny money, and that would make the American dollar too expensive for foreigners to use. So by being allowed to pay in silver for that brief window of time in the summer of 1933, when FDR tried to give the crown a chance to redeem itself, the crown had squandered the opportunity by paying only a meager portion of their obligation. Belgium banks still exchanged their money for gold until 1935 and France until 1936, and banks charged a small fee for exchanging money between the warring countries and enjoyed the fluctuating exchange rates when money moved back and forth. Britain had set up a currency stabilization fund in 1932 by putting £175 billion into an account for use in stopping speculators and shortly had to add 200 billion pounds more. When more dollars were needed to buy pounds, the British bankers would buy up pounds, and when pounds began selling for less than dollars, the stabilization bankers would buy dollars, and so the stabilization fund lost a little money but kept the currency from being destroyed by foreign currency speculators. In 1934, the U.S. Treasury set up a stabilization fund of its own with two million dollars of the two billion eight hundred and twenty two million three hundred seventy five thousand seven hundred fifty seven dollar profit from the revaluation of gold and because Belgium stayed on the gold standard until 1935 the panicked Germans could take a suitcase full of Belgium cash to Germany trade it to Germans desperate for a gold-backed currency, then take the tenfold German money back to Belgium and exchange it for more Belgium cash to take to Germany. The counter-black market experts, once they were trained, soon found they could come to profitable terms with the Marche Noire. They worked in the f in with the French. The most scandalous rackets were organized. For example, 50,000 sweaters were sold in a single day, not once, but four times over. The first three buyers were simply assassinated. The fourth was himself in with the group of swindlers. Consequently, the sweaters could again be offered for sale later on. Meanwhile, the amount realized from the first three sales was already in the bag, 
V's, three times the price of 50,000 pullovers. People disappeared, locomotives disappeared, hundreds of thousands of kilos of the best cigarette paper disappeared. Wilder and wilder grew the activities due to the corruption of the security police in the counter black market office. Agents continually arrested or assassinated one another. Gestapo officials masqueraded as French gangsters and the latter as Gestapo officials. The Monte Cristo cover-up by Johannes Mario Simmel, translated from the German by James Clue. Original title, It Can't Always Be Caviar, New York Doubleday and Company, Inc., 1965, Popular Library, 1977, page 323. The British were demanding only gold from Germany so they could pay America, and FDR melted down the 445,500 double eagle $20 gold coins made in 1933, and it became illegal for the Treasury or any American bank to exchange gold for cash, which meant that foreign speculators couldn't buy dollars with gold take them to Germany to trade for wheelbarrows full of cash, exchange that German cash for gold in Switzerland, bring the gold to America, and make a 50% profit buying up more dollars. On September 12, 1939, a young American diplomat traveled by the regular 8.35 a.m. express from Paris to Brussels. He was dressed like an English banker and carried a big black pigskin pig suitcase. Officials on the Franco-Belgian frontier were very strict. The immaculate young gentleman's diplomatic passport, which opened out like an accordion, enabled the representatives of both nations to identify him as William S. Murphy, official courier to the American embassy in Paris. His baggage was not investigated. In Brussels, the American courier, who really was a German named Thomas Levin, checked in at the Hotel Royal, producing a Belgian passport in the name of Armin Deacon. During the following day, Deacon, alias Murphy, alias Levin, spent three million French francs in Bru Brussels buying up dollars. The francs came out of the black pigskin bag and the dollars went into it. Thomas's original stock of three million francs had been supplied by his own little bank. Political events had caused the international value of the French francs to fall by 20%. Private citizens in France, in their panic fear of a further devaluation of the franc, were intent on buying up dollars. Consequently, a dollar quotation, dollar quotations had risen in a few hours to astronomical heights. This was not the case in Brussels. Their dollars could be acquired at a substantially lower price, since the Belgians had not been infected by the French terror of war. They expressed their firm convictions by the statement, We shall remain neutral. Under no circumstances whatever will the Germans attack us for the second time. In consequence of the swift decision taken by the French government to forbid the export of capital, no foreign countries were being flooded with French francs. The franc, therefore, in spite of the unfavorable circumstances, was remaining fairly stable, just as Thomas had anticipated. Its relative stability constituted, so to speak, the axis of the whole operation. Thomas Levin, as William S. Murphy, traveled back to Paris with a suitcase full of dollars. Within a few hours this valuable currency was so eagerly snapped up by the same rich people, was eagerly snapped up by the same rich people who intended to leave their country in the lurch as soon as possible and carry off their capital into safety. Thomas Levin made them pay double and triple prices for the realization of their despicable plans. His first journey brought him in 600,000 francs personal profit. Next, again as William S. Murphy, he returned to Brussels with 5 million francs in his courier's luggage. He repeated his procedure. The margin of profit rose. One week later, four gentlemen with diplomatic passports were traveling back and forth between Paris and Brussels, as well as between Paris and Zurich. They were taking francs out of the country and dollars into it. 
Two weeks later there were eight of them. Thomas Levin was in charge of the entire transaction. Monte Cristo cover-up, page 61 and 2. When bankers banded together for a capital strike at the beginning of 1938 to protest the New Deal economics, they told Hitler to stop spending for war, and Hitler had taken this for a Jewish plot. Hitler believed that Germany was bringing truth out into the open by naming the Jews as the Antichrist, and he said that Germany would be victorious because America and England were still not confronting the reality of the Jews. Germany had heard the message coming from the BBC and matched Britain's rearmament efforts, while Britain's rearming did not improve things for the English working class and in support of working people. Hitler was welcomed into Austria by the common folk. The Nazis said there was no room in the Reich for people more rich or more poor than themselves, and that they who did not work should not eat and Nazis wanted everyone to be middle-class and hard-working, but they were split between either the socialists tending towards communism or the nationalists comprised of the leftover nobles and their supporters, so Hitler chose the name of National Socialism to bring both sides under his common flag. At the end of the Great War, Two and a half million Germans were dead, and three million Russians were dead, and two million Austrians were dead, along with 1.7 million Frenchmen and a million English. And the Great War had cost the crown over 13 billion pounds, and an entire generation of British women found themselves without husbands, so Parliament opened the doors of public offices and professions to the female gender by passage of the Sex Disqualification Removal Act. The coal miners were threatening to strike again when they saw German workers under Hitler being treated so well. So the coal miners went out on strike again, and the Crown threatened to nationalize the mines, and that stopped the strike. So to keep the peace, the railroad workers were finally given a minimum wage. Mussolini was buying coal from Germany in 1935, shipped direct by railroad, so the British Navy couldn't interfere. And Britain was unable to sell their coal, now being bought from Prussia at a better price. And the British were shipping oil from Iran and Iraq through the Suez Canal, as well as opium from India. And the French held the port of Djibouti. The islands of Malta and Cyprus were the only resting place for the British, short of Greece, because Arabs had learned to mistrust the British after Lawrence of Arabia had given them promises during the Great War that he couldn't keep. The king of Ethiopia, Abyssinia, had thrown every Englishman in jail in 1867, so the British had sent the army to conquer Ethiopia, even though it was a homeland for Italy, because Italians had lived there ever since they'd once been Rome. Britain asked the League of Nations in 1935 to boycott Italy buying coal from Germany, and Britain also didn't like that Italy was helping the Spanish kick out their royalty. And the BBC began broadcasting a drumbeat of war against Italy. In response, Italy helped Ethiopia, Abyssinia, set up some big guns on the coast across from Mocha right next to French Somalia at the end of the Red Sea. And the Italians pointed the guns at the British sailing from India towards the Suez Canal on their way to the Mediterranean, while the British would stop and rest and refuel in British Somalia. Britain made a speech to the League of Nations on September 11, 1935, that was about stopping aggressors by force. But everyone knew that Britain and France had agreed to split Ethiopia between them, because the secret had leaked out when the signed written agreements were quote-unquote stolen and sent to Mussolini and distributed from there, while both diplomats who had signed the papers were fired for having allowed the documents to be stolen. 
The French welcomed the Italian presence on the Red Sea to make sure Britain didn't seize all of Ethiopia instead of just their half. And Stalin made a pact with Hitler because the BBC propaganda against Germany was reaching new heights and the British were boycotting Russia and as their part of the pact to split Ethiopia, Abyssinia. The French were supposed to march to Poland's defense and cut off the railroad towards Italy, bringing Prussian coal to Mussolini from Germany. While Britain was making the speech against Italy to the League of Nations to launch their Ethiopian campaign, Wallace and Edward arrived by train to do some shopping among the clamoring crowds, then got back on the train to Budapest to take in some gypsy violin playing. Military conscription in Britain in 1935 had been helping put the unemployed English to work, but they needed Germany to pay reparations from the Great War to finance that conscription, and Poland had been promised immediate military assistance from the British if either Russia or Germany invaded to protect the coal being shipped to Mussolini. France hoped the division of Ethiopia, Abyssinia, would go smoothly and that the British would not screw it up, and France did not want to have to march towards Poland to cut the railroad carrying coal to Italy, because the French had put a lot of time and money into building the Maginot Line for the defense of France, instead of having to send the French army outside its borders, and French soldiers manning the Maginot Line were enjoying a daily ration of a liter of wine every day. Churchill wanted military bases in Libya and Italy and Greece and Turkey, and Stalin wanted to know why the Soviets shouldn't govern Iran and Turkey because they shared a border, and FDR told Stalin he should keep his warm water port at Darin or Port Arthur, and Stalin sent General Zukov to the Balkans to keep out the British. Italy went to help their countrymen in Albania, and the Greeks made the British withdraw to Crete. But Greece needed Italy to help force the British out, and for that Italy needed German paratroopers who were more than successful in the first ever military assault by parachute. The morning after the speech to the League of Nations on September 11, 1935, the British fleet sailed into the Mediterranean having left England several days earlier in anticipation of the speech, and upon arrival were quote-unquote showing the flag, while Mussolini thought the British were just coming to divide Ethiopia between themselves and France. Mussolini sent his soldiers over to protect the French half, and Mussolini even thought he had Britain's permission and was certain there was not supposed to be any bloodshed. The Ethiopians, Abyssinians, were deeply religious Christians with an educated king and queen, and they looked down on the Eritreans next door as mere tribal folk. And on the 3rd of October in 1935, the Italians arrived in Eritrea and were welcomed by dancing natives delighted at the opportunity to brag about their Italian friends to their Ethiopian neighbors. It was Italy that had championed Ethiopians, Ethiopia's admission to the League in 1923 over British objections that a country where slavery still flourished was unfit to be allowed into the company of civilized nations. The argument had collapsed when it was revealed that one of Ethiopia's largest slaveholders was the butler to the British minister and Addis Ababa, and that the minister was not disposed to deprive the butler of quote-unquote his life savings. In 1928, a treaty of friendship had reaffirmed the cordial relations between Italy and Ethiopia. World War II, Prelude to War, by Robert T. Nelson and the editors of Time Life Books, Alexandria, Virginia, Time Life Books, Inc., 1977, page 154. The British called for a vote about Italy the week after Mussolini arrived in Eritrea, and all those doing business with Britain voted aye, 
and agreed to the boycott against Italy, and the League of Nations recommended that the Suez Canal remain open, and Mussolini saw that as an approval of his helping France to police the Suez Canal, and didn't think much of the boycott, because it would probably force Britain to lower their prices. British journalists sent to Ethiopia were ensconced in its only western hotel where the British army gave daily press conferences to the newspapers. And on the 21st of May in 1935, Hitler had given a speech in the Reichstag reporting that Russia and France had signed a mutual assistance pact in Paris on the 2nd of March and again in Moscow on the 14th of March, but that it had not yet been passed through the French Parliament. Britain then signed the English-German naval agreement on the 18th of June in 1935 with the promise that Hitler could have the port of Danzig back, and 90 days after that Hitler introduced the Nuremberg racial laws on the 15th of September, and 30 days later Germany withdrew from the League of Nations on the 14th of October in 1935 on the anniversary of the 1066 Norman conquest of England. The Pope had made his pact with Hitler ninety days earlier, on the 20th of July, in 1935, and Archbishop Pacelli had been the Papal Nuncio in Berlin during the Great War, and was staunchly anti-communist. And two weeks after the Nuremberg Laws, Goebbels became the director of the Chamber of Culture while the British press were busy publishing stories in the newspapers, maligning Italy and broadcasting vitriolic stories about Mussolini over the radio. The Italians were appalled that the British had given inferior weapons to barefoot Ethiopians and were paying them to shoot at Italians. And because the Ethiopians were also shooting at Eritreans, the Italians gave Eritrea weapons to defend themselves, and war World War II started to spread mud hut by mud hut. As one cynic observed, the experts who had drawn up the list of items to be denied Italy were, quote, not lacking in a sense of humor, close quote. The items included camels, mules, donkeys, and aluminum, a metal Italy itself produced in enough quantity to be exported. And though industrial important commodities like nickel, tin, and rubber were shut off, no embargo was placed on the sale to Italy of the fundamental raw materials of war, coal, iron, steel, and, most notably, oil, without which the Duce's motorized forces in Ethiopia were certain to be stalled. Behind the closed doors of the committee that had prepared the list, Britain and France had argued that depriving Mussolini of oil might drive him to spread the war to the European continent, perhaps starting with a quote-unquote mad dog attack on the British Mediterranean fleet. Such suppliers of oil as Russia, Romania, and the Netherlands had seen no point in stopping their trade with Italy, they knew that Miss Mussolini could count on continued imports from the United States, which was not a party to the sanctions, though Congress had passed a resolution of neutrality immediately upon Italy's move into Ethiopia and embargoed armed shipments to both sides. It had not banned petroleum sales. As finally approved by the League, the sanctions re represented little more than a slap on the wrist. But Mussolini seized upon them to spur his people to greater effort, including support of a buy Italian campaign. To ease the financial strain of the war, voluntary contributions of gold were invited and were soon forthcoming. In nationwide public ceremonies, more than half a million Italian wives and their husbands made a gift to their government of their gold wedding rings, receiving bands of steel in return. Another enthusiastic source of gold was the clergy, the Duce's staunch admirers since his 1929 accord with the Vatican, settling a long-standing conflict between the papacy and state. World War II Prelude to War, page 151. The British went to Paris in December of 1935 
to make a proposal to the French that Italy should be given the whole of Ethiopia if the British were allowed access to the Ethiopian king through a narrow corridor to the Red Sea. And Britain had sent Somalis from British Somalia in to shoot at the Ethiopians, who didn't want to shoot at the Eritreans any more. And the British hoped the Ethiopian king would beg Britain for protection against the Somalis. And the situation went from bad to worse as the Ethiopian king chose the Italians over the British in March of 1936. And the French agreed to let Hitler have the ramp. And the French agreed to let Hitler and the French agreed to let Hitler have the Rhineland if the reason Britain was spoiling for war was just to get money out of Germany to pay its debt to America. The Germans could make money flow like water from the Rhineland, where France had moved, had failed to motivate the German-speaking Rhinelanders towards more productivity. And when the British told the King of Ethiopia, that he was in danger of being assassinated, the king of Ethiopia agreed to come from his palace through the narrow corridor to the Red Sea and board a waiting British warship that would carry him safe to safety in London. But first, the small Ethiopian king wanted to stop in the Holy Land to pray for peace in Jerusalem. Within four months of the Nuremberg Laws, Edward VIII had become the King of Britain in January of 1936, and the French Parliament brought up the Russo-French Pact again on the 11th of February in 1936, quickly passing it 27 votes later on the 1st of March, 353 to 164, and within a week the German army occupied the Rhineland. The Germans marched across the Rhine on the 7th of March in 1936 with strict orders to retreat at the first sign of French resistance, and the British claimed that 35,000 German troops came over the bridge while Hitler said there were only four brigades. And on the 29th of March, Germany voted an overwhelming approval of the new Nazi policies in another landslide referendum. The British took the Ethiopian king to the League of Nations in Geneva to make a speech on the 30th of June in 1936, but the League of Nations voted two weeks later to lift the embargo against Italy, and Hassel, the German ambassador to Rome, would be fired on the 4th of February in 1938. The British had spearheaded the economic boycott against Italy when the Italians had been invited into Ethiopia in 1935, and the British had hoped it would force the world to buy more goods from Britain, but boycotting Italy didn't help England export more because nobody wanted to buy anything the British were making. So the Crown started rearming themselves for a replay of the Opium Wars to force English products upon the world.